Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to, I don't know, number 40-something in Nautel's Transmission Talk Tuesday webinar series. Going to have a little bit of fun today. Um, I'll tell you about the backstory after I introduce my guest. With me today, I've got the handsome and talented Josh Bone from Bone Broadcast down in uh, Chelsea, Alabama. Josh, welcome, and glad to have you with us. Hello there, sir. How are you doing? I'm well, and I should tell, so I've got Broom Broadcast Services in here, but uh, and I don't know if I'm letting out of the cat, the cat out of the bag, but you're also involved with uh, Max Connect. I am. I uh, uh, We created Max Connect uh, six years ago, and uh, we're actually in the process of uh, going through a rebrand to the Max Connect Group. We're uh, uh, changing from Bone Broadcast Services to the Max Connect Group to represent more of a uh, our more of our diverse offerings so yeah there you go so you know you I'll, I'll expect the check for the pr plug later on but uh, thank you thank you very much appreciate that yeah there you go now josh uh, for what it's worth josh usually gives me a couch to crash on whenever i'm down in that neck of the woods so i'm, and, I'm pretty and, sure i've been fading full and then some and surrogate cats yes Always good with the surrogate cats. Still, <laughs> TT still likes me more than she likes you, but that's a whole she, different she, story. She sent it. She sent. She sent her regards this morning. Um, she uh, she left a pile of cat puke on the ground for you. So. Oh yeah, there you go. She knows it's coming someday. So on that note, what what brought this on? Uh, Josh and I got talking about a month ago, and. Uh, I was mentioning, and well, he he does a lot of stuff with course transmitters all over the place, and uh, he was mentioning, I was mentioning, there have been a lot more, seems like anyway, a lot more off-air emergency situations this year. Now, I haven't really done any actual counting to be specific, but I can tell you that as a rule, the number of off-air emergencies we deal with, you know, somebody calling, I need a quote, my such and such burned up and I got to get a new transmitter, et cetera. As a rule, we get one or two of those calls per month, and it's safe to say that I've probably had one or two of those calls per week for the past several months. So my theory, and Josh is kind of thinking the same thing, has been that uh, last year was the year where we were doing eight, nine, ten remotes a day almost as everybody was gearing up to work from home and getting all the uh, on-air staff geared up to work from home and, uh, you know, not uh, be on camera in their skivvies or, or whatever or whatever, make sure they actually have a connection. And I think a lot of those uh, those situations ended up being a um, one of those uh, issues where a lot of site maintenance had to get deferred. So I figured it was a good time to have a chat about maintenance and some of the things that you need to do, some of the things you might be able to work around and some of the ways we can sort of, I, go, I don't know, I guess, transfer things from an in-person to a remote perspective, so to speak. So yeah. does that make sense? Did I get that right, Josh? I think so, yeah. Um, that was one of the things that we dealt with to a point uh, a lot of our customers were able to kind of the, uh, most of our customers were already set up to do a decent amount of remote work so that wasn't as much of a problem for us we actually uh, you know our company specifically we spent more time dealing with transmitter sites last year because since the the studios weren't manned and they had they were already set up for remote uh, uh, remote on air and remote voice tracking and things like that, that was held uh, with our customers that was handled a lot more by the IT people. Mm -hmm. We had one customer we had to set some stuff up with, but we were able to actually get a lot of transmitter site projects done last year. Yeah, but, and that was uh, one of the things I was beating the drum and saying, you know, hey, social distance, and this is the ideal time to be out at the transmitter site. Absolutely. They, you know, you know, don't go to the studio. The problem was, is there they they didn't want there were some companies that didn't want anybody at the studio including mm -hmm. uh including um engineers and there were I, I know there was at least one company that said we don't want anybody at any property at all and i talked to a couple of engineers and they're like they don't even want us going to the transmitter sites i said why there's nobody there it's and the best time. so that was that was the whole thing it's like yeah the, you know you're not allowed to go to your studios you're not allowed to go to your transmitter sites unless something breaks well you're inevitably just saying things are going to break 
because if you're not able to do preventative maintenance in any form, then sure, you know, an air conditioner can only run for so long with plugged up filters and yep. the transmitter can only run for so long with a failed air conditioner. And pretty soon it becomes a cascade effect. Right. And that's one of those, I mean, Brad mentioned in the comments that uh, he's uh, may have to bug out early if UPS shows up with his new J1000. So yeah, you know, exactly. And, and Mark is, uh, Mark's telling me he is uh, just getting, just getting ready to embark. Mark, I just, let me scroll up here. I got uh, too much on the go already. Oh, he's out on his site maintenance tour in Nebraska. Well, just speaking oh. of socially distanced, there's a good way he's doing firmware updates, and we'll uh, talk on that as we uh, get going here, too. Nice. So before we really get rolling, even though we already have, um, the usual housekeeping things. If you're new to these uh, sessions, then we absolutely um, invite all your comments, criticisms, concerns, anything. Uh, you can either type it into the little question window and it'll come up on my screen here and I'll uh, grab it as I see it or wherever I think it fits. I try to hit everything. If I don't, we'll hit it with an email later on. But usually my uh, batting average, I think, is pretty good unless you all get too carried away on me. And uh, beyond that, if you uh, have a microphone and feel like being part of the conversation, hit the little hand wavy icon up there on your screen and we're more than happy to uh, unmute you and uh, make you part of the conversation. On the rare occasion, if you hit type a wall of text in there and I don't feel like reading it all, may ask you to open your microphone anyway. So uh, <laughs> we just try to, we try to make it as interactive as we can and involve as many people as we can. Um, by the way, if you're an SBE member, attending this or any Nautel webinar qualifies for half of a recertification point under category I of the research schedule. So. Certainly, uh, whatever you use to keep track of your uh, certification points, add a half a tick to that, and uh, you'll be good to go. If you're not an SBE member, why not? And uh, if you are and aren't certified, again, why not? Um, so there you go. And uh, Wayne Pacino, I see our SBE president is uh, in the audience. He doesn't miss many of these. So uh, absolutely glad to see Wayne here. Um, I see several people in the audience that I recognize from other times. So, yeah, I think we're going to have some fun today. All right. All righty. Moving ahead. So the funny thing is anybody that was here last week when we talked about uh, grounding or I think it was the week before, recently we talked about cooling and air conditioning. And the funny thing is I used a lot of the same subjects because the concept doesn't change. So we will talk about the pros and cons of deferring maintenance. Obviously, you know, if you're trying to do more with less, anything you can put off is a good thing. But you um, absolutely, there are some things that you shouldn't put off. Uh, Josh made a good point. We're uh, coming into the warm season for a good part of the world. So air conditioner, condensers, drain plugs, things like that. Um, how many times, Josh, and, and you're down in the south where it does get warm, so the air conditioning is a little more of a deal than up here in the uh, frozen tundra. Yeah, it's uh, that's become a, a major problem uh, as so many companies have just basically let air conditioner contracts go. And what we've we've done, one of the things that we've done in uh, in improving sites is we've moved over to a lot of mini splits, which makes it a whole lot easier to have a closed system. You don't have a giant air handler, the compressor's a lot smaller, but you still have to keep them clean. And that's that's mm -hmm. the thing that I've had to explain to people. They're like, oh, I, I got this great new air conditioner and it, and it quit working. And you go out and you, I mean, you look at the coil and it's just this giant wall of yuck. Wall. Uh, yeah. <laughs> When's the last time you sprayed some water through it? Yeah, so yeah. that is, that's a serious issue. And especially if you're running older, package air conditioners or I, I had a site once that the uh, it was running uh, an old 35 kilowatt tube transmitter and the only air conditioner was a two ton trailer air conditioner that had been put in there as a temporary 27 years earlier mm -hmm. and it was and it had a the, the the inflow duct was made from wood and it was just a disaster but it ran for 27 years because they maintained it yeah. and like this thing was never designed to do what it's doing, nor was it designed to do it this long, but they, they kept it clean. And, uh, you know, we continued that while I took care of it. And then at some point, at, right after I left, it did finally die after 31 glorious years of service. <laughs> so oh, let's see, got a couple of things come in. So Shane Tobin mentions uh, deferred maintenance, pay me now or pay me lots more later. And that's like uh, the, the yeah. analogy I always use is oil changes in cars. 
you know, you can do your $40 oil changes every month or four or three, depending on how much you drive, or you can replace the motor every two or three years. Your call. Yeah, that's exactly right. Depending whether so. it's a four cylinder or a, uh, or a, a six or an eight. Um, yeah, uh, let's uh, hit a few more of these. Uh, I see Kirk Karnak's in the audience. Uh, so Kirk asks, uh, do you uh, self-install the mini splits or do you pay a pro? You, you've got an HVAC guy on staff, don't you? I do, um, and he he's done ours and he will do them for us. He's not certified in all the states we work in, but you know we've quietly put them in for other places. We've actually done self installs uh, on the, you know, the last three mini splits that I've put in were $600 off brand mini splits that I bought off eBay. And mm -hmm. they work fine. And uh, you know, that's one thing that I learned in talking to people is, you know, 90% of the mini splits are made in the same three factories in China. Doesn't matter whether they say Mitsubishi or Della but mm -hmm. they all work the same way and for seven hundred dollars if you can get three years out of it you know that's better than paying nine thousand for one that you might get ten and right. you know the ones that we've put in both in the office and at transmitter sites they all just kind of work mm -hmm. and with the self-install when they come pre-charged as long as you have basic knowledge of how to seal them and you make sure the flare is correct on the line set they, they work great you know uh mike yeah. has done three of them on his own and he never did air conditioning before so yeah right so i'm gonna open a can of worms on a non well non but related topic uh jerry olson asked uh, speaking of firmware updates when should i be planning field trips to my notel sites uh, some of them get one visit for non-snow season so that that's a, a loaded question, and uh, I'm thinking HTML5 AUI when I think of this. Uh, I'm assuming that's what Jerry meant, but maybe the question was more innocuous. Anyway, if you got a VS transmitter, plan that trip later this summer. Um, if you've got a NV light, probably this fall before snow season starts. If you've got an older NV, probably next spring. But uh, so you'll be working on the app a little longer on those ones. Um, however, they are, even though they've been out of production for eight or nine years, they are on the upgrade schedule. We're not just going to leave you with the app forever. Um, Ira Wilner mentions uh, air filters, and that's another good point. Um, oh, yeah. Definitely. And, you know, we're getting into pollen season and cottonwood season will be soon. And uh, anything that moves forced air, whether it's a building air filter or these folks that like to put hardware cloth over an intake port and just suck raw air into the transmitter. Um, you know, so the transmitter looks like a teddy bear exploded in it. Those uh, those are the sort of things that we're going to be seeing a lot more need for over the next couple of months. And it varies. The thing, like I always say, it's situational. You know, what Josh deals with in Alabama won't be what I deal with up here in eastern Canada. Won't that's be right. what Mark deals with in the cornfields in Nebraska, for example. Yep, that's exactly right. So you do have to, it's why I won't make hard and fast recommendations, but I do absolutely make, uh, you know, suggestions that you should do this. You just need to figure out when. Um, Brad makes a good point. Don't forget oil changes and backup generators. Somebody posted yes. on Facebook recently a generator that had 300 some odd running hours on the original tar, I mean oil. It, well, it was basically tar at this point yeah wow yeah so. i mean the generator for my house has got 12 hours on it so far and it's no yeah about 12 hours and it's on its second oil change well and block heater maintenance is also um you know we're getting into summer so it's not as big a deal but that's something that even down here if you're if your block heater on your generator goes out which they tend to do every couple of years you know, mm -hmm. once that, that first time that has to run and it's 40 degrees or below, good luck getting it to start in any timely manner. So that's yeah. something to definitely keep keep an eye on is make sure your block heater is actually doing something and not just blowing the breaker. Yeah. Now, Mark asks, uh, what about sites with no running water? Ideas for cleaning out coils on HVAC. And I mean, the, for me, the first thing that comes to mind is a gas powered pressure washer because you can adjust the pressure. And as long as you got a water tank, you've uh, got some flexibility. Yeah, the uh, uh, oh, tractor supply sells the big plastic totes that you can put in the bed of a pickup or you can put them on a, a pull trailer or whatever and fill those up. And, you know, that's the thing. As long as you get a pressure washer with, um, 
you know, with a, 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 a spigot on it or some type of a pump to continue feeding it to it. Yeah, that's a great option. We've done that in a couple of places. If that's not an option, say your air conditioner is on the roof of a building because your transmitter site's on the roof of a building and you can't get that water up there, uh, cans of coil clean work. They're not ideal, but they do work. And then you can take a garden sprayer up there and pump it up and, and spray some water into it. Uh, you know, pressure is always better, but like Jeff said, you have to make sure you adjust the pressure because if you hit it with the most aggressive nozzle that pressure washer has, you can kiss your fins goodbye. Yeah. So, and that's a, that's a good point. The garden sprayer. My wife has got one of the little. Uh, it's like a three gallon uh, pump up uh, type deal, mm -hmm. and that thing you you pump that up, you can spray for a good long time off of a uh, off a charge on that, depending on how much air versus liquid you've got in the tank. Well, they also have the uh, the battery powered ones that you can get, and I can't remember who makes them. That you can put on your back, and it has like a five gallon tank on it, and you can mm -hmm. mix up your cleaning solution in that, and it's almost like a pressure washer. Um, it just doesn't have quite the oomph, but it does give you the ability through a rechargeable battery pack to actually get a decent amount of pressure to clean something out. I've seen some HVAC guys do some cleaning with those. And yeah. uh, they seem to work pretty well. They're, I mean, they're they're not cheap. They're a couple hundred bucks. But if you're maintaining a lot of sites by yourself, that's probably a good investment. Yeah. So getting back to the software again, because I knew, like I said, I knew I was going to be opening a can of worms. But it, it's one of those, you know, we try to address it. So uh, the let's see, VS transmitters with one X firmware. <laughs> Kirk, my friend you're going to be buckling your seatbelt for a while. Um, actually, it won't be that bad. You'll have to go up to one or two intermediate levels. So you're going to want to allow for a couple hours. The funny thing is the latest upgrade, the, the newest one on the uh, alpha version that we're playing with now, it's a six minute process as opposed to over a half an hour before. So it's, it's going to be a whole lot easier now and coming forward. Um, John Van Milligan says he's hoping the VS beta will show up before he retires. You and me both, John. Um, but I've got a little <laughs> further to go, so I think my odds are pretty good. Um, and then Marco asked about NX and GV. And, and the reason I picked VS and NV is because those are the two ends of the bracket. Um, the VS is uh, being done right now. It, it's so close to beta that I can taste it. Um, and Matt's listening somewhere in the audience cringing because he's afraid of what I'm committing him to. Um, <laughs> and I know the NV sometime next year will be last. The goal right now is to have GV and NX done again later this uh, summer, early fall. Uh, depending on the specific site, would a GV, all of them be done? If you're in like Farnsworth in Utah or, or some of the higher elevations out west, you may not get those done before snowfall. So, you know, just just be aware. And uh, yeah, it, it is being addressed, but uh, I'd be the first to admit it's not nearly as fast as I was hoping for. Um, let's see. Jerry says, we've got a new transmitter with a small oil leak, or new generator, sorry, with a small oil leak, so it gets uh, fresh oil on a very regular basis. Um, Multi-stage thermostat. Uh, yeah, we've talked about this before in cooling, but uh, doing uh, like a, a couple of thermostats or and using one to set as an alarm. We've done that. Um, I've seen like the 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 precast buildings, the thermobond buildings, and things like that. A lot of times will come with the Dayton hard set thermostats, one for one for low limit and one for high limit, and they're just connected to a closure that you can connect to your monitoring system. Uh, that's one way to do it. I've done it with the cheap $11 battery powered thermostats from Lowe's before. We're just, you know, hey, I need a cheap way to monitor whatever. What we've started doing recently is um, for sites that actually have an on wall thermostat and not a uh, and not like a, a mini split with a remote control. We started putting wise thermostats in because mm -hmm. they connect back to your wise app. And you can do that and cameras and doorbells and, you know, alarms and everything all through one ecosystem. And that not only gives you limit notifications if your temperature gets too high, temperature gets too low, it'll also tell you if your air conditioner isn't working. You know, it tried right. to turn the air conditioner on. It couldn't. It sends an alarm to you. And mm -hmm. they're cheap. They're like 60 bucks. And, yep. you know, you do programmable schedules on them if you want to. They can do, they have ones that can do humidity monitoring. Um, 
yeah, I've got them. We put those in here at the office and I'm starting to put those in at a lot of our, our client sites just so that they can monitor them along with the cameras that we put in uh, at all the sites. And that that's also become a big thing, especially in the last year with the, uh, you know, deferring of maintenance and not being able to visit sites as much because of other things is being able to monitor your site with some some, some kind of camera. You know, I yeah. mentioned the, the wise cams and I know Alex has put those in in a lot of places. Um, yeah. You know, um, I know a bunch of other people that have too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I've got a few photos coming up. A um, couple of comments on the uh, pressure washers. William mentions uh, pressure washers will fold over the fins, like you said. So yeah. definitely your your pressure is critical. Um, Brad mentions Ryobi makes a battery powered pressure washer and DeWalt might as well. Um, Mark makes a good point about checking the coolant in your generator when you're uh, at, a, at a site. And that again is one of those situations where uh, you don't want to defer these sort of things. Um, generators, and again, it's situational. You know, if you're down in Josh's neck of the woods, I mean, rolling into hurricane season and tornado season, this is generator season for y'all. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, for us up here, we're coming out of snowfall season and going into lightning season. So pretty much all year is generator season for <laughs> us. And once we're done lightning season, we'll be into hurricane season for the North Atlantic storms. So, yep, yep. It's, it's an ongoing thing. And I don't know how this works down in the States, but in, in this part of the world, more and more, we're seeing a lot more. It's uh, cheaper to repair the wires than it is to uh, cut all the trees and do all the maintenance. So. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not sure who made that judgment call, but, you know, they, they probably didn't work maintenance for a living. Um, the, Jerry mentions they use uh, a monthly, quarterly, semi-annual and annual inspection and maintenance check checklists, uh, date and initial lights, AC, heat, filters. Uh, Jerry, if you got a microphone, there's a lot here. And uh, I'm going to get uh, Ed to unmute you and uh, make you part of the conversation because you didn't raise your hand. But, boy, there's a lot of information in there. And I, beat it. I beat Ed to it anyway. So, uh, uh, yeah. So, Jerry, if you do have a mic, unmute. If you don't have a mic, then uh, we'll carry on. Ah, uh, nope. Sorry. Oh, well. well so, yeah. Um, anyway, um, that looks, Jerry, you and I are going to talk about making this a uh, tips article in the next uh, next uh, issue of the Waves newsletter. So, uh, there's a lot of useful info in there. Um Let's see, John Van Milligan, don't forget the filters on the VS300s. That is a good point because yes. they're not immediately visible on the 300. Yes. They're on the sides. Right. Um, not like the one or the two and a half where they're right there in the front. And uh, then all you got to worry about is the guy that uh, took the front panel off and just dropped a new piece of foam over the old dirty piece of foam and uh, clipped the front panel back on. No, you put a bungee cord over top of the front panel to cover the old piece of foam. Wouldn't be the first time I've seen that either. <laughs> we've seen we've seen that site together. <laughs> yeah. So the one thing that uh, you absolutely should not be deferring, especially if you have an AM site, is yard maintenance. Yow. Okay. Yes. Um, I took the top picture. Uh, the bottom one came from an associate who I will allow to remain nameless because I don't recall if he still engineers that particular site or not. Um, and I did a terrible job of uh, crediting these photos. So if I show a photo and it belongs to you, send me an email so I can remember who I got it from and uh, credit it properly in the future. But yeah, um, this is one of those situations where you don't know what's hiding in there. And I mean, I've started carrying big vials of DEET with me because of the chiggers down south. Yes. You know, and up, up here now it's uh, wood ticks. Those things are ferocious this time of year. Uh, yeah, your your wife has a special affinity for those. I know. Uh, that's why you this haven't. That's why you haven't been invited back in a while. So yeah. That's right. I'm bad luck. Every time I come visit, Dana gets a tick. So. <laughs> Let's see. A uh, couple more. Oh, here's a good comment from Brad. But uh, William mentions um, older generators, typically about pre-1990, use a flat tap at non-roller type camshafts, which need oil with zinc in it. Modern oil doesn't contain enough zinc, so you got to use a ZDDP additive oh. and CDDP sort of. So that is good information. And this yeah, is one of those situations where if you're not intimately familiar, it's like I say with almost anything. I mean, I'll do very basic maintenance on my truck, but if it's time to crawl under the hood, I want somebody that knows what they're doing to get under there. 
Yeah. So, and same with the generator. If I'm tasked to maintain a generator, I know enough to be dangerous. So, you know, I can do like my home generator with the owner's manual, but if I had a transmitter site generator, I'd probably get a company in to do that. Yeah. Um, again, one of the things you can do like diesel oil, uh, I didn't know anything about diesel reconditioning until a couple of years back. So, and that's uh, something that's always fun to watch up. Uh, Mark mentions that he has a spray company sterilize around his uh, building's towers every spring. And you can do it that way. You can lay down gravel and landscape fabric, uh, round up. Uh, what, what's your defoliant of choice, Josh? You're down in Kudzu land, so. There is a, there's an industrial defoliant that we can get at the, uh, at the co-op, and I can't remember what it's called because I had a guy do it this year. Usually we end up doing it, but it's pellets. And you put those down and it will kill everything inside that fence for the entire season. And, you know, we, I, my, my transmitter site at my AM that I own, when I first got it from the previous owner, I told him, I said, are you going to come uh, clear the jungle down here? Oh, well, it's not that bad. I said, I can't see my ATU. I said, you're going to come, <laughs> you're going to come and clear this. And there was a little forest that had grown in the middle of the field, about five feet from the fence. And I said, what is with this little forest here? He's like, well, when I first bought it, I, I cut the stuff inside the fence down and I just left it piled there. And that's what grew. I'm like, yeah, you're going to cut that down too because the tree was smacking into the tower. I'm like, no, this isn't. So ever since we took it over, we're pretty good about keeping the grass cut and keeping the foliage down. And because you yeah. have to, especially with an AM, because you know you end up with a moisture rich weed that comes up mm -hmm. and smacks into your tower and it starts blowing PAs in your transmitter. So uh, Ira, Ira has noted here that we clear when the AM stick starts getting SWR from the vines. And I didn't bring yep. this picture in, but I've got a picture of a site from the Northeast where they were calling me and said, seven o'clock every morning when we bring it up to day power, it, it starts hiccuping. Mm -hmm. And it was SWR alarms. And sure enough, moisture laden vines crawled up that you couldn't see the bottom four feet of the uh, tower, including the base insulator and the pier. It was solid vines. So that's a good one. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, Duncan has included a link for a permethrin uh, insect repellent and uh, made by Sawyer. And they're, they're the folks that make the DEET that I uh, squirt onto my legs every time. Uh, one really good note, and Duncan mentions it here, if you're using a permethrin-based stuff, be very careful around cats with it. Uh, it's yes. It's pretty toxic to it is and a, very, very a toxic toxic domestic animals, yes. Yeah. So uh, absolutely, that's that's a good point, but it's an excellent resource. Um, Ed, if I could get you to uh, throw that link that Duncan put there into the uh, into the um, chat, that would be awesome. Um, let's see. Hello from Ecuador. We there got things going by here. Y'all are uh, chatting up a storm. I'm trying to keep up. Um, hello from Ecuador. We were at our site when a big storm hit, found the wind was blowing water into the generator shack, which led us to check the motor, and we found that the coil had been damaged. So absolutely thorough check of the generator. And Alan, that's a really good point. Ed has thrown the uh, link that uh, we got from the uh, permethrin uh, treatment into the uh, chat. So absolutely go check that out. Um, Alan, or Aaron makes a really good point. Maybe bringing my new goats out to my AM site. They do love blackberry bushes. Absolutely. Goats are an excellent way to keep the foliage down. They'll also you know, go through your fence. So. They'll, uh, they'll clear out all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, let's see. Heavy vegetation, chiggers and ticks are bad enough, but encountering stakes. Yep. Um, yep. So one of my very first early day site visits and anybody down in the Texas, New Mexico area will remember Don Jones from our specialties, Texas. Yep. And uh, Don and I were down, I forget where we were now, somewhere around uh, Comanche, Texas. And we walked out of a transmitter building and into the field. And of course there's a fence around the towers and he gets to the fence and there's a broomstick laying there. And I'm like, you're not like you're sweeping the grass. And so he opens the fence and he grabs the broomstick and it's like tap, tap, tap in a little semicircle around us. And then he stood there. Then he moved a couple of feet, tap, tap, tap. And I think the third or fourth time he did that, we hear, and, and he backed up. And I said, okay, well, I understand backing up. <laughs> 
Yeah, and this big old uh, diamondback or something. I don't know. They're all rattle-headed copper moccasins to me. But this, this big old <laughs> snake comes slithering out of there, and I decided it was time for me to be anywhere else but here. Um, so, uh, yep, that's uh, that's a really good point. Let's see here. Okay, I've so done it, I've done mothballs and ATUs before in snake-laden areas, and it does tend to keep them out if you've got yeah. large holes or large openings in your ATU. And also if you have large openings in your ATU, you really ought to consider covering them with something. Yup, yup. And uh, I've got pictures of birds nest in ATUs and all that great stuff. Uh, Jeff birds. Wilson makes a comment oh. on the uh, on the permethrin and, and DEET stuff. Don't spray it directly on your skin. That's a bad idea. Yes, um, very much so. It, yes. it, will also, it will also stain white clothing. So you should test it on whatever you're wearing before you just go crazy so yeah yeah ira mentions an am site where the cows like to scratch their backs on the guy wires lots of cow fur which can cause corrosion that's good to know yep and uh let's see yep that's a good point from william soil sterilization is a is a nasty business so good to have a company that specializes yeah. Um, he mentions uh, weeds no more in central Ohio. So if you're in that neck of the woods, somebody to look up. But uh, definitely when you get messing with the poisons and the restricted chemicals, and depending what state you're in, the state actually may have laws specific to who's allowed to apply stuff like this in a commercial setting. So yes. uh, from an insurance and OSHA perspective, really good idea to make sure that it's something that you're able to do. And uh, never hurts to have somebody uh, that uh, is used to working with it. Let's see, had a six in or six foot gopher snake get into my building and electrocute itself on the rectifier stack of an old tube rig and defoliation yeah. helps quite a bit with snakes. And that's true of snakes and almost any rodent, they like having the cover. If you keep the grass trimmed, you're, I'm not gonna say you're not gonna have any, but you'll have fewer of them as a rule. If you have a, if you either have gravel or uh, uh almost like a concrete moat, which is what I've called it, which is basically like a two foot wide sidewalk that goes the, around your building. You will cut down mouse and rodent and snake penetration significantly just by having that clear area because you're exactly right. They like the cover. So. Yeah. And gophers that, I mean, I've been to sites in, uh, in Colorado where, I mean, the, uh, the ATU, the uh, antenna field was, was practically a target range just for the gopher holes. Whew. So uh, let's see. William uh, emailed me a snake picture from one of his sites. Okay, that'll uh, that'll end up in a future presentation. I know I can see this <laughs> coming along. And uh, let's see. Uh, Mark mentions that snakes don't like sharp rocks. So, so yeah, of uh, gravel, sharp edge gravel. What is it? Yeah. Uh, class B or C? I mean, we use a lot of crusher dust here because it packs down. But for this, you'd want the the bigger gravel, like granite, crushed granite. Yeah. Yeah. So here is something that uh, all the uh, landscaping in the world won't treat. Uh, and another reason for the site visits is Yow. occasionally making sure that all the nuts and bolts are tight. Yes. And that is something that you can put off a little here and there. But and, and the funny thing is, the older your gear is, the more you can put it off because it's the newer ones that the copper is still compressing underneath the uh, underneath the um, lug. Yeah, but uh, after a while, you know, a lot of the air gets uh, gets um, displaced, and and it's going to tend to be less of a chance of working loose. It still needs to be checked. Yeah, and a good way to check that, uh, if you if you want to check and make sure it's tight without actually touching it, get your FLIR camera out, the FLIR one or the cell phones with them built in. Hold it up, Jeff. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> you, you knew it was right beside me. <laughs> But we've caught multiple sites where breakers were heating up, wires were heating up. Um, one we actually caught, told the owner about it, and said, there's a problem with this breaker. It's undersized. It's burned. You need to replace it. He didn't, and it actually burned his building down about three months later. So yeah. that's, you know, this, what you see in this photo uh, is very preventable just by popping the cover off and hitting it with a FLIR and okay, that's a problem and you can take yeah. care of it usually pretty quick. It's, it's here's a bit inconvenient, the... but it, you can do it. There it is. Yeah. So there, there's, let's see if I can get it uh, zoomed in, see the, of course the camera, there we go, we'll get the camera not looking at my face as much. 
But so the FLIR camera, this is made by FLIR, F-L-I-R.com. There are a bunch of other ones out there. Um, they're down below a couple of hundred bucks now as a rule. Yeah. And they are worth their weight in gold when it comes to uh, saving you and figuring out where things are. Not just for this. I mean, you can look at uh, at uh, all kinds of things. Um, I, I know some folks are mounting them on drones and doing uh, heat inspections on towers, looking for yeah. hot bullets and hot spots in the line, things like that. Yeah, um, we did a we did a we did a transmission line inspection with ours about three months ago, and I found in what what equates to nine feet of line, I found six hot spots. Mm -hmm. So we're not sure whether when it was installed, if every bullet was split or how that even happens, but there's six hot spots and nine feet of line. So that's going to be a break apart and kind of rebuild that whole section at some point. So, yeah. Yeah. Ira mentioned she had a rat snake living in a phaser waiting for mice, but occasionally getting zapped, triggering XSWR recycles. Took a few weeks to find the snake when he heard something jump in the cabinet as the transmitter relays fired. <laughs> Oops. So I'm going to segue into a story. I was down in Louisiana once. Well, I've been down in Louisiana a whole bunch of times, but we're working on 50 kilowatt down in the bayous. And uh, the, I was uh, working with the local guy down there. He's uh, well, Paul uh, Strickland, who's uh, I think last I heard he's running a dive shop. He may not even be around. This was 15, 20 years ago. But uh, we were in the transmitter building and the transmitter had been up and running in the phaser running in the load, everything was good. Uh, all of a sudden it started tripping. It was, I think we'd come back one morning, turned it on, it was just trip, trip, trip. And uh, so we shut it off, we put it into night mode, came up just fine. That's weird, put it in non-D, came up just fine. Put it back into the directional that it was supposed to be on, on full power, it started tripping again. And uh, looked through the phaser, nothing, couldn't see anything. I said, we're gonna have to go out and take a look at the, uh, at the um, antenna site. So we go out and start walking the towers and we open an ATU, nothing, everything looks good. Close it, go to the next one, open the ATU, everything looks good, go to the next one. Of course, it's the last one you go to always because always. well, that's when you stop looking. But open one and came face to face with the front half of a very upset rattlesnake who was wrapped around a contactor. Oh, jeez. And uh, <laughs> He slammed the ATU door and he looked at me and he goes, I ain't touching that. And I looked at him and goes, your site, I ain't touching it. <laughs> um, so he goes, well, what are we going to do? So we go into the building and of course the factory guy being young and foolish and uh, having infinite resources and not really all that worried about it. I walk up to the transmitter, set it to 50 kilowatt preset, hit reset, tick, tick, tick down, reset, tick, tick, tick down, reset, <laughs> tick, tick, tick down about seven or eight more times and it stayed up. And I said, there we go, just grab a broom. Yeah, <laughs> so, and then you had rattlesnake for lunch. <laughs> it tastes like chicken. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, Dan mentions, if you don't have repellent to put on, you can protect your legs by using electrical tape around your pant leg and shoe or boot. And that is a really good point, uh, especially yeah. if you're hiking in the woods, uh, electrical tape. And again, I've mentioned it before, I'll mention it again. But uh, hockey tape is uh, is also really good for that sort of thing. Fabric, well, fabric and if, tape. And if you don't have any tape, the other option, and I've done this many times, tuck your pant leg into your white sock or whatever sock you've got on. As long as you've yeah. got some way to keep your leg isolated from the outside, that'll work. So. Yeah, and white socks, white regular old white sports socks are great for that because the, the cool thing about them is you can get back to where you're going and before you get in the truck, you can just take a look at your leg. You'll see any ticks on them usually, yep. unless ticks, they're really flea. small. Ticks, fleas, anything. White socks are a great way to be able to find any type of annoying little bugger. Yeah, you're not going to see chiggers on them because those things are just too small and just, uh, uh, I hate those. So anyway, that's yes. uh, those are and, and Mark mentions that if you don't have a FLIR camera, that one of the things that just as a general guide and one of the things we always used to do before FLIR cameras, just put your hand on the panel. Yeah. Obviously okay. on the cover of the panel, you know, not on <laughs> something like this. But, uh, but grab, that bus, grab that bus bar, see if it's warm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't do that. But, uh, but ab absolutely, you can uh, use something like like just a, a touch, and it's like, oh, that feels a little toasty. Maybe I should check this out. 
So, you know, the FLIR camera is great because you can sweep a whole building with the FLIR camera in 30 seconds. But, right. uh, but if you don't have one, just run your hand down the panel and see if any of the breakers feel warm. There so a that's site, a really good point. There was a site we used to take care of that, well, I used to take care of it even before I, I started the company, that uh, I first walked in there and there was a disconnect on the wall. And there was a little screen cover. One of the knockouts on the bottom was knocked out. And there was a little screen cover on it. And the panel always made a sound. And I, I asked the chief, I said, what, what's, what's the deal with this? And he mm -hmm. said, look on the top. And I looked and there was a muffin fan mounted on the top of the panel. And it was sucking air through. And I said, what's that for? He said, because the fuses get hot. Mm -hmm. I said, the fuses get hot. Yes. I said, didn't anyone ever think that was a problem? <laughs> No, no, they just, they, they told me to just put the fan on. I said, who told you that? The electricians. I said, how about you find a new electrical contractor? <laughs> but as far as I know, I haven't taken care of that site in almost 10 years now. And I, I did talk to the guy there a couple months ago. And I said, is that fan still on the disconnect out there? He said, oh yeah. He said, no, I've never had to change the fuses. Okay. But that was one of the stranger things that I'd seen. So. Yeah. Yeah. You run into a lot of times creative solutions um, and fans are one of those things. And this is an example of when you don't have enough cooling. Uh, filters have typically big honk and mica capacitors in them. Big honk and mica capacitors, depending on your frequency, your modulation, various other things can get toasty. Yes. Um, they can also have hardware work loose, which is a different thing. And of course, they are prone to lightning. Well, you're not going to fix that. Uh, well, grounding maybe a little bit, but uh, you know, you're not going to stop all of it. However, airflow is critical for stuff like that. And some gear, they just have ventilation holes and rely on you to provide the air hole or the airflow. Other places, they'll actually put fans in and fan filters, like we were talking about before. Um, Let's see, John mentions when you find a burned out panel like this, the FLIR uh, purchase is also almost automatically approved. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> it's the stuff underneath. Back to the bugs for a second. Curtis Stefan mentions, and I just like the way he worded this, had an old shirt in the vehicle, Hulk hogan it, and used the strips to wrap around my pant legs to keep the bugs out. So uh, <laughs> I think you may have dated yourself there just a little bit, Curtis. Uh, as, uh, that, that's an 80s reference if I ever heard one. But uh, <laughs> What's the old saying? Any port in a storm. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, you do what you got to, and that that would work really, really well. It just gives you, again, a way to sort of make a seal to to keep the critters out. Yep. So only thirty nine. Okay. Well, there. So now we got a younger guy. I'm feeling. Thanks. Now, Curtis, I'm feeling same, way too old now. Same age. Same age as me. Good for you, Curtis. Yeah. <laughs> Kids these days. So the other that's, thing. That's awesome. That's awesome. When, and, and again, <laughs> I got these and I cannot for the life of me remember who I got them from. I'll go through and check my emails. And uh, oh, Andy Lowe's there, 36. He's got you both beat. We're going to ah. do a contest for a swag kit next uh, week or some week and just see who the youngest person is. So if you're under 40, stay tuned because your odds are going to be pretty good. <laughs> um, I can't tell you how many of these radio station, well, I don't know if you call the right one radio station temporary. I'm not exactly sure what I, that is. I've seen some real scary grounding, but wow, that's that's a whole new level of badly creative. <laughs> it's a, and it's a, it's a nice bus bar too. That's the thing. Well, isn't it? It's wonderful. And, and I mean, I don't even see any indication that there's no locks underneath the uh, shield, but they, they dutifully stripped off the shield. Uh, yeah. William wants, William's asking what your uh, favorite uh, grounding preference is, uh, vice grips or tie wraps? <laughs> well, apparently this person's was tie wraps. So yeah. And yeah. this is well, a vice grips I only to use, the, the I, I only I only use vice grips to uh, to attach AM feed line to AM towers. Just as long as you remember to paint it. Exactly. <laughs> so this is one of those other situations where a lot of times we'll have contractors out doing stuff like painting the tower. And uh, occasionally you need to kind of ride herd a little to uh, make sure that uh, little, uh, little things like um, like uh, dealing with uh, getting insulators. This is the uh, feed for a uh, shunt fed for the skirt feed on a tower. Um, and 
once you paint it, I not it's not going to be an immediate issue, but uh, it's definitely a uh, a potential challenge. Yes. So um, yeah, that that's uh, certainly something. Um, Mark Simpson has uh, told a really good story here, and Mark. If you've got a microphone, I am going to reach down here and uh, there, you are unmuted. If you want to unmute and tell that story, uh, you've got a good point here about some of the bigger critters we run into. Yeah, there's <clears throat> there's been times um, where I've gone up to the mountain um, or other locations where it, it's mountainous and you tend to run into bobcats, mountain lions, as well as rattlers and javelina, the, fir the first thing you should do is try to scare them away if they're coming toward you. But it's always a good thing. I mean, it's usually against company policy to have a weapon inside of a building, but there's always like a kind of a wink nod. You know, we understand when you go out to the transmitter site, you're alone. And this goes to inner city uh, places as well. You don't know who you're running into that is stripping copper out of your air conditioner. Um, Mainly, you want to scare them away, but every once in a while, you come across a mountain lion or something like that that's standing their ground, and you have to fire a warning shot toward them and to get them to to get out of the way. Uh, but you know, you got to think about it in 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 a couple different ways, I guess. Um, you know, you don't want to hurt the animal, but you also don't want the animal to hurt you. And going to a transmitter site to fix something isn't worth your life. Yeah. So you have to protect yourself. But more importantly is just like training on transmitters and studio equipment and stuff, you have to train on that weapon, how to handle it properly. And um, especially for people that are, you know, going to mountaintops or inner city locations. I mean, you talk to any special operator or whatever, keep one in the chamber because you don't know what's coming at you the second you step out of your vehicle. And, you know, if you're in a transfer site, keep the door closed behind you and open it slowly. Look, look around as much as you can because you don't know what crept up on you while you were in there. And if you can make it to the car, get in the car and sit in the car until the, the threat is passed or, or whatever. Call 911, obviously, if it's a, if it's a person. Um, if it's an animal, good luck getting, you know, wildlife preservation out there to trap the animal so you're kind of on your own yeah well and w one of the things that we always have tried to do and i've tried to make sure that my guys understand this to that end mark is when you go to a site if you've got a fence around the site that's big enough to pull your vehicle into it it might be inconvenient to open the big gate the whole way but if you're there alone pull your vehicle in and lock the gate behind you because that does help keep some immediate threats out such as animals and it makes it more of a challenge for a person to be right there when you pop out absolutely and even that said mark's got a really good point you want to uh be very careful to just maintain that vigilance and yeah the, a lot of times it's easy when you're at a, a site in the middle of the woods in the middle of nowhere to you know not think about the threat so much but uh you know, Chuck Lakatus has got all kinds of stories about coming out of a site and coming face to face with a Kodiak or whatever up in Alaska. So, uh, yep. yep. And and I, I like your point, Mark, to the training. I mean, that's one of them, you know, I, I grew up back uh, before we had anything that even resembled gun control in Canada. So gun control is using both hands, but uh, that that's a whole different topic. Um, my point is that if you're going to handle something like that, you very well, it, it's not just a matter of using it safely. It's a matter of using it responsibly in a threat situation with adrenaline flowing. And yep. that's a specialized level of training beyond just going to a shooting range. Yeah. So Mark, thank you for that. That's a, that's some really good points there. Um, let's see, we got, uh, okay. The typical comment about grounding. So, um, We've got a uh, new winner in the uh, Young uh, Young Engineer Award. Uh, Alex Levin is here at uh, 26 years old. All right. Very so, good. Very good. Uh, if anybody can beat Alex at 26, pipe up in the chat. Otherwise, Alex, I'm probably going to have Ed reach out and send a swag kit your way because I think we just uh, we found our new competition for, for this week anyway. Uh, <laughs> 
Let's see. Alligator clips with 24 gauge wire for grounding. You can't lose with that at all. Thanks, Ira. That's uh that's a wonderful that's a, thing. That's a that's a of. that's a fused link right there. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, good comment here, and I'm going to just I gotta scroll this up there. Just a comment uh, from Benjamin, and uh, Benjamin, thanks for uh, being participating. Benjamin is here for a lot of these. He provided some uh, information on uh, on uh, site maintenance not too long ago. But uh, not only check the tightness of the connections, but also the yeah electrical cleanness of the wires and connectors. So if yeah. you don't have the camera for looking at the radiation, you can uh, do voltage drop measurements and uh, various things like that. And that comes back to, and I mentioned it in passing earlier with the picture of the uh, tie-wrapped coaxes, but uh, Nolox, some kind of antioxidant. And I mean, I, I picked Nolox, there are half a dozen others. But uh, something just to, because especially if you've got dissimilar metals, you're going yeah. to have some corrosion or oxidation happen between them. So having an antioxidant is a good deal. Sort of like the, the old old folks putting the Vaseline on battery terminals. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, same concept. Um, just uh, uh, do you have a preference for that, Josh? Uh, what, do, what do you guys do for stuff like that? No, it, I mean it, we're pretty much in the same same situation as you. The the no locks really does make a difference, and you have to be very cognizant of galvanic corrosion um, it, with dissimilar metals. Not only just in, in electrical, but when you're, you know, if you're putting a transmission line together, some transmitters that you get, or you know, if you're cheap out and you buy a, an aluminum elbow and you connect a brass elbow and a, a copper field flange to it you will end up with you know galvanic corrosion on that so you've got to do something to uh you've got to do something to mitigate that um anytime you have a mating of dissimilar metals so mm -hmm. so uh let's see uh yeah we may bracket the uh, age group uh daryl said we're talking about the youngest how about the oldest engineer in this webinar so uh yeah, we uh, we may uh, throw throw that that I think we'll do that for a future one. We limit ourselves to one swag kit because if I give away too much swag, it gets a little cranky because it's all coming out of his budget one way or the other. <laughs> Ira mentions if you're doing overnight transmitter duty at a new mountaintop TV transmitter and he'd raise the audio level on the monitor to full tilt it before heading out for bathroom duty just to warn any critters in the area that it's time to find another place to be for a bit. And yeah, same deal. Sometimes just making the noise is uh, is all it takes. Buy one um, of those uh, stadium air horns and keep it with you. I mean that that'll scare away almost anybody. And if somebody gets too close, it will deafen them. So there you go. I know it'd make me have a biological incident. That's for there sure. You go. <laughs> but uh, that's uh, not necessarily something I'd uh, want to be proud of. But uh, it, it is what it is. Loud noises and I don't play well together if I'm not expecting them. That's uh, that's how right. most people are. So yeah. All right. Now flipping ahead here, we, I put all these slides up. So this is one I haven't looked to see if Alex is in the audience. This is uh, one of the stations that Alex Hartman engineers in his infinite spare time, and I don't recall if this was the station owner or a contract person. But what you're looking at is the rebar that was put in place to tie um, flagging tape to, to alert the plow guy as to where the pavement ended in the driveway. And the reason the snow was melted underneath it is because he drove it through the primary power feed to the transmitter site. Yeah, that this seems is one of right. Those this That's is one of those situations now on the plus side it was winter in minnesota and it was easy to dig the hole to find out what the problem was even in the frozen ground because that particular part was nicely thawed yeah. uh, <laughs> call, eight one, uh -huh. call 811 kids call 811 <laughs> yeah well and uh that is absolutely the uh sort of thing that uh we could we could uh talk for days about situations like that um Duncan suggests you doing a poll at the start of the next webinar to see what the age distribution is like. And we absolutely can do polls in these. I've never really done it, but yeah, maybe we'll uh, we'll do it that way, Duncan. Thanks. That's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, I know Ed's taking notes in the background. So again, in Alabama, y'all hardly ever see snow. When you do, it's an event. I see it all over your Facebook pages and it's highly entertaining. Yes. Um, but uh, certainly when you do see snow, where we don't like to see it is inside it's, our equipment. Is in the PA, yes. 
Now, this was one of those emergency replacement situations I was talking about earlier. In this particular case, what happened, it warmed up the next day. All that snow turned to not snow and uh -huh. melted down through the final and uh, into the power supply. The and, other, uh, yeah, the, the, the other thing to, along that is if you've got a tube type transmitter and you have a, an exhaust duct, which so many of them do down here, and it's riveted or bolted or taped to the top of the transmitter and there's no air gap, you yeah. better make sure that you keep some positive pressure on that because if that thing gets turned off and you end up with negative pressure and it's humid, then any dirt, dust, yuck that's in that cavity turns to mud. We had to, right. replace, I think it's been about two years ago, we had to replace an entire cavity to every socket, everything, because it was caked in two inches of mud that got sucked in from a negative pressure vent. So, right. And yeah. the other challenge there becomes when, not if, somebody uh, you know, <laughs> bypasses the uh, airflow interlock, then uh, you're you're just asking for for a nice healthy site fire. Oh yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so this particular one, Shane is in the background telling me that this particular picture is not the one I thought it was. So this one did stay snow. Um, Shane, since uh, you brought it up. I've unmuted you. Uh, tell me the story, if you don't mind. Oh, this is, uh, you guys hear me? Yeah, 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 you're good. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is one of my favorites, actually. Um, I had just started uh, my new position out in Wyoming. Um, we got a call that one of our stations was off the air. Okay, station's on the other side of the state. So get in the vehicle, drive over there with, uh, with one of the other guys. Uh, first thing I notice, there's a spot on the side of the building where there's supposed to be an air hood. There is no air hood. <laughs> and bear in mind, this is Wyoming, so the snow is blowing sideways yeah. directly into that air hood <laughs> or where the air hood or, should be. Or, or lack thereof, yes. <laughs> yeah, or lack thereof, exactly. So the next thing I notice, the door of the building is kind of hanging off its hinges. And I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> So we so we go into the building, uh, and that's when we start looking. I see, you know, little bits of snow peeking out from the front of the transmitter and up above the transmitter. I'm like, oh, that can't be good. <laughs> <laughs> so I open the tube cavity, and I look, and there are, of course, dustings of snow inside the tube cavity. Oh, that's no, that's no good. Definitely um, not good, no open the access hatch to this air vent on top where the tuning stub pokes up into. And of course it was bolted straight to the top of the transmitter, no air gap. At least it um, had an access hatch, half of the ones. Yeah, there. thankfully, yeah. thankfully, yeah. yeah. And and was greeted by this. <laughs> so um, it did get that transmitter running again, but boy, it was down for a long time and it took a, quite a while to, uh, to resurrect that thing, get all the snow out of it first, thankfully still in snow form, uh, yeah. and then find out what blew up. And, you know, it was a new tube socket. It was all kinds of new stuff. And we finally got that thing back on the air. But so we yeah, had, that was one. Did we you ever find your hood? <laughs> no, actually, that was one of the first <laughs> things I did when I got back was uh, engaged a uh, sheet metal contractor to fix the hood and engaged a uh, guy to do the door as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, and we had one less than two months ago, I want to say, because their new transmitter just went on the air. And same deal, only their issue was the snow blew in through a vent and, uh, you know, nice horizontal uh, Midwest snow. And uh, it, uh, they were co-located sites, so it wasn't cold enough. So all the snow melted down through, like I said, down through the uh, final and into the power supply and, and pretty much took out the whole work. So... Well, and of course, this site was one where the transmitter was the only thing keeping it warm. So once it went down, you're once pretty it good. went down, it stayed cold. Yeah. Yep. Now, Greg Manfroy, thanks for that, Shane. That, that's like I say, I've heard this story when I got the picture. Now I remember who to credit it to. Um, Greg Manfroy, know, know an engineer who uses copper rod with this oxyacetylene to bond copper connections instead of map gas and silver solder to avoid galvanic corrosion. And that is a really cool thing. I mean, you're literally brazing at that point only, yeah. well, no, you're welding because you're using similar metals. So 
I don't know. I mean, my thoughts on that are either way. I mean, the galvanic corrosion, if you're displacing all the oxygen, usually you're not going to have much an issue. So I don't think that'd be that big a deal. But what, what do you think, Josh? You probably got more experience than I do. No, I would tend to think that that it's basically what you said. If you're doing it as a, as a chemical bond with uh, with heating and a torch, then yeah, your your corrosion problems are going to be significantly less, if not zero. It's more if you're bolting or relying on a pressure connection that you're going to end up with a dissimilar metal galvanic problem. Um, I've seen electricians, those uh, Milwaukee makes those power crimpers that heat up and you put the solder paste in it and it squeezes it with like 16 tons of force or something ridiculous. And they do that with the solder paste so that they can clamp copper to aluminum cable with a copper or brass clamp and it won't corrode because of the solder paste and that thing with the pressure that it puts on it, um, it squeezes all the oxygen out so you don't end up with the corrosion. And those things are great. I really wanted to buy one of those, but they're like four thousand dollars. Not so. something I'm going to keep in the back of my pickup as a rule. No, so, no. Now, one thing to note, and Greg brings a good point. If you hit Google, you can find the uh, galvanic table of uh, metals, and uh, yes. your basic goal is to have things as close together on that table as you can. So like if I took something from way up top and connected it to something way down below, that'd be a much bigger issue than there are only two or three items separated. Right. So absolutely pay attention to that. But uh, Greg, thanks for that. That's a, that was a good discussion point. Yeah, that's um, great. Back, back to the, uh, the snow entry in the site. And of course, living up north and uh, where, I, where the folks I tend to hang with, I get all kinds of these pictures. Um, but this comes back to one of those where you were bringing up early with the wise cams. And I mean... Mm -hmm. Just being able to see if, in this case, somebody left the door to your transmitter site open, yep. or if you've uh, got a vent that's uh, kicking out uh, or letting all kinds of air blow or uh, snow blow in, or, or weather of any kind. I mean, Wise Cams, I've got one upstairs. They're 30, 30 bucks a piece, give or take. Yeah, and we've, put, uh, we've probably put 50 of those in at various sites. And I've got I've got a whole wise ecosystem here at the office. They make an, a they make a monitored alarm system now that connects yeah. to your Wi-Fi. And it's the 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 amount of time that it has saved us in driving to a site to diagnose something that you can see a fault light on the front of a transmitter through a camera, so you know exactly what to bring. Okay. I need to bring a spare exciter. I need to bring something to replace that IPA or whatever you, to be able to see it even through a camera you mm -hmm. know in our in our case you know we have clients that are you know three and four hours away that's a day wasted if you drive down there get there don't have what you need and you can't always possibly have ever well you can but realistically you can't always possibly have everything that you could ever need packed in the back of your vehicle I tried for years and inevitably I would get somewhere and whatever I needed was still at the office. So I'm going to drop a, a little side note on there. Um, and, and this is a, a chance for you to do a quick plug too. Uh, this, we're running hard on time as always. When have I ever finished on time? I see a reason, no reason to start now, but uh, with the wise cams and things like that, a lot of folks are like, well, we don't have internet out there and we can't get internet out there. And I mean, I know my site, we had to get a dedicated fiber to the tune of several hundred dollars a month. Yeah. So, um, but you've got a solution for the folks that can get any kind of cell service pretty much. Yeah. Um, Max Connect Wireless is the product that we offer that will um, serve transmitter sites very well. We've got uh, over 500 of them out in the field right now. People use them for all kinds of different things. A lot of our sites that had no connection, we have one that's out in the woods um, down just west of Montgomery that they had, n th there's no option for any type of terrestrial internet there. So it's either cellular or satellite. And mm -hmm. the cellular coverage was even spotty. And we, you know, put up a couple of directional antennas above the roof line of the building and they have a solid signal. We've got two wise cams down there, one that watches the front of the camera or the front of the transmitter and the doors. And then we've got another one that actually watches outside to make sure that nobody's, you know, prowling around or stealing any copper or anything. But it, it really makes a difference. Uh, pricing isn't atrocious. We've got all the major carriers uh, in the U.S. We've also got Canadian and Mexican coverage now. So, um, you know, we, we've got Rogers in Canada 
and AT&T and uh, Movitel in uh, Mexico. So yeah, there's lots of options. Any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, if you need my contact information, uh, Jeff can give it to you, or uh, it may be at the end of this presentation. I don't know. So well, I'll tell you what, Ed, if I could get you to throw Josh at bonebroadcast.com into the chat, then everybody's got a link to your email anyway. There you go. Spam the heck yeah. out of me. <laughs> That's it. Uh, own broadcast, B O H N broadcast.com. And Josh, of course. So Marco had asked if it was available for Canada. You covered that. John Van Mill Milligan mentions they have outdoor cameras at some sites so they can see the driving conditions. And yep. over and above that, I've got a, a couple of sites in less than desirable areas where you take a look at the webcam on your phone before you walk out to see who's hanging around your vehicle out in the, in the parking area. Oh, that's interesting. I've never thought so, to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, William Bowen mentions that Max Connect works great for remote broadcast too. And uh, that that's a good point. I'm going to bring you back next month if you're free. I want to talk about, you're doing some interesting stuff with, uh, with remote controls and SNMP. And uh, I want to have an SNMP session. Sure. And uh, I think we can uh, fit this in. So that I think that's going to go in June. Um, Ed's sitting there groaning because I just got told we were going to have a meeting about this tomorrow and I'm already announcing the schedule. So there you go. <laughs> uh, on that note, we have hit, uh, of course, like I said, we're always past the top of the hour. A um, couple of resources, absolutely. This webinar and all our webinars are archived. You can find them on our website through the resources tab or on our YouTube channel. Just uh, search Nautel Limited. Um, or Nautel will do. Uh, I think there's a bicycle thing related thing that has Nautel too, but I think you'll figure out transmitters versus it. Um, we've already got a comment. Yes, help with SNMP. So we'll definitely have some fun with that. Um, Ed's just thrown the info at Bomb Broadcast link up there. So uh, that'll, uh, that, there you go. Uh, sign them up for all the mailing lists, folks. Fill up my inbox. There we go. <laughs> Yeehaw. Um, Waves newsletter, we bring it out every two or three months, give or take. Uh, absolutely, I put a tips article in there, try to keep it as uh, non-sales oriented as I can. Like I said, I uh, saw something in the com comments here that will become an article in the near future. Um, Barry Mishkin's uh, BDR.net broadcaster's desktop resource. Uh, he does a weekly uh, Thursday lunch meeting and I tend to show up on that at least once a month. So uh, by all means, folks, lots of stuff. I want to thank you, Josh, for coming by today. It's uh, Thanks been for a lot of fun. Me. Yeah, absolutely. Then, folks, I want to thank you all for spending the last hour and 10 minutes with us. If uh, we can help, go give us a shout. But in the meantime, have a wonderful day. Thanks. See y'all. Bye now.